Hi, this is Lance Wall. Now, welcome to the 7M War Room. Our mission is to take the complex and make it simple, to take the hidden and make it conspicuous, and the spiritual and make it relevant. And so right now we're going to be looking at the cycle of news, the fastest cycle of news uh, in the world is happening right now. This has been a month of firsts. We have never experienced the uh, kind of reversals and topsy-turvy revelations that are, that are coming out, such as what's coming out of the, the deep state being exposed, the coronavirus uh, literally rewriting the playbook on liberty throughout the United States, and then we have this massive economic challenge, which is the greatest unemployment rates that we've seen since the Great Depression. Meanwhile, we have an unusual president in the White House who I've said all along since 2015 is providentially placed in this moment in history because of what I predicted was going to be the fourth crucible for the United States, the fourth test of our survival as a nation. And now here we are in this process, but let's take a look at the uh, timeline as we would see this from a, uh, if you will, a providential or even a prophetic perspective. Because the plain fact of the matter is, we've been looking at events that are unfolding from the Jewish calendar, Passover, all the way through Pentecost. And why would we look at the Jewish calendar? Well, because the very history of the Christian church is tied into the Jewish history. And the Jews then observe their feast days, and those feast days are very specific and very accurate because they base themselves on the lunar calendar. And so when we're looking at the, the flow of history, it becomes more than coincidence. It becomes almost like a divine marker to be able to say that uh, Passover occurring, let's say that would have been, uh, for us, it would have been the highlight of that would have been around April uh, 15th or 16th or so. Uh, in that period of time, as we go into the Passover and the resurrection story of Christ coming out of the grave, moving that towards the next event on the Jewish calendar, which is May 31st, is going to literally be Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost would be the number 50, or penta. And so what you have is this gap between Passover and Pentecost. And in the first century church, this was the Lamb of God that was slain. And then the resurrection, the power of that uh, empty tomb. And then the period of time in which the disciples were told to pray, at which point the power of God came down and visited this 120 uh, ragtag group of followers that were hiding out in an upper room in Jerusalem. Why this is important for us is a, a Jewish man had pointed out to me that unlike any other time in our history, we didn't just celebrate or uh, acknowledge Passover, we experienced it. So think about this. We experienced what it meant to be huddled in our homes, as the Jews, Jewish people were, as they applied the blood of the doorposts and lintels, and the plague passed over. And he said that we, he believes that there is an experience that is coming to us. And I have to say that there's a great, a great amount of enthusiasm and excitement among many believers about the hope of something changing and something happening. And so we began to see the virus itself beginning to break up in terms of its, its crescendo of activity kind of hit a punch during this period as even the president was calling for a national day of prayer. We are literally pressing in to a moment of time that is shifting. And oh, so much is happening right now. During this period of time, we have the revelation of uh, what's taking place with Michael Flynn, General Flynn, as you might remember, uh, was guilty of giving erroneous information to the FBI on what? It was a casual conversation. Two agents came to his office to discuss with him, tell him, tell him he didn't need to have a lawyer there. And they already had transcripts of conversations he had with um, uh, Chris Krisiak, the, the ambassador for Russia. And Flynn, the incoming national security advisor, had a, a protocol conversation saying that they were open to discussing um, what was going on with Russia and working with the relationship with the United States. 
And so that was a technical problem in terms of the FBI saying, well, did you have any communication with uh, any Russians? And they knew he had. And so, of course, he said, oh, no, no, nothing uh, really that involves any, you know, no. And so right there, they had caught him in a, a trap, a perjury trap. The problem is they had no authorization to be able to inquire about that. And there was actually no crime committed in what he did. So if you don't have an authorization to investigate me about a certain crime, and you're the FBI, and you ask me about whether you know the hot tub was moved Saturday, or if I was ever in the hot tub, and I lie, so I don't even know there's a hot tub. Uh, well, hot tub isn't an issue, and uh, you're not even supposed to be interviewing me for a criminal activity in the first place. This was all set up in order to remove Flynn. Now, the notes are coming out that the FBI literally rehearsed to set a trap to remove Michael Flynn and Comey in his smug uh, pomposity, actually came out and said, I took advantage of the confusion of the transition to slip two guys in there and take Flynn out. And they're all high-fiving each other. That's how delirious they are. Meanwhile, a three-star general and a man who served his country is set up by rogue agents working in the intelligence community to take him out. And why did they take him out? because this man here would have been an obstruction to their work to impeach Donald Trump on fake Russia collusion uh, accusations. And it was the intel community. Remember what Trump said? He said um, <clears throat> that he believed that the intelligence community was at fault. And <clears throat> Schumer actually challenged him and said, oh, they can get you a hundred ways from Sunday. I wouldn't even talk about that. Meaning the Senate is afraid of messing with the intelligence community. Think about that. They won't call them out. But Trump did. And Brenner, Clapper, Comey, and we're going to find out, President Obama himself were in on the setup to take Flynn down. And that's all coming out right now. We're going to be back in a moment and go into depth on this subject. You know, it's amazing how many times people say to me, wow, I just discovered you. How come I never heard of you before? It's actually a very humbling experience. Well, the reality is we've been around for a while, but social media does have the ability to kind of amplify your reach. And I want to encourage you, if you want to get a hold of all the subjects we've been working on regarding the uh, future of what's unfolding in America, the economy, how to even find and discover your own calling and manifest it, then this is your discovery moment also. Facebook is a great way to go if you're an older demographic like myself, but the YouTube is universal and we have a special channel that you can access all of our present and, uh, and older material. But the uh, podcast is probably the thing we're the most excited about right now because we've discovered a lot of people are loving podcasts. And Instagram, I'm still trying to figure out, thank God, I've got people that are taking care of Instagram for me because I don't know how to do it properly. There's also TikTok. I don't know if you've heard of this yet. It's the rage with kids and all of the 10-year-olds and younger trying to get me to dance. I'm probably not going to do that. But you can join us over here, LanceWalnut.com, a specially exciting place because that's where I like to give away certain products every month that I think you might be interested in. I look forward to seeing you in any of those places. You don't want to miss the connection between the praying that is happening and the warfare that is taking place. That's why we're called the War Room. We're looking at the battle over nations and the battle over the future of the United States that's happening right now. And so in the midst of this, we have the National Day of Prayer. And so there's a, a gathering in the Rose Garden. And I just caught this uh, by surprise, really, because it wasn't obviously on the news cycle. You don't see this stuff in the news. But there, there was a moment when various people were praying. And I want you to catch this prophetic moment. Because Paula White, who has been fasting and praying, asked the Lord for a word and delivers what we would consider to be a prophetic charge to the President of the United States. And the amazing thing about Donald Trump, if you know him, is that he actually gets at a gut level when something is real. And, and real raw spirituality gets him. It's like he can tell if it's the real deal. So let's take a look at this segment 
where Paula gives a word to the president after praying. And if you could zoom in on it, I don't know if our Mr. Producer here can do this, but what I want you to see is the president who is normally saying, thank you very much, thank you very much, and then moving and introducing the next person, he is arrested and he's kind of pausing and processing what just happened. And, and then he pulls his thoughts together and goes on to the next speaker. But it's because the word of the Lord actually spoke to him. And what a word. We're going to analyze it in a second. Let's go back here and take a look at it. So here we are. President, one last word. Like David, who had had victory after victory after victory after victory, would face his biggest battle. It was called Ziglag. And they would take his wives and his children and the city would be burned down. And he cried and he wept and he began to pray out to God and God gave him a word. And through fasting and praying, I believe this is the word for you and for this nation. The Lord spoke to him and said, pursue and go after them and you shall without fail recover all. Sir, the word of the Lord, I believe for this nation and for this administration is you will recover all. Now watch this. Incredible, Paula. Thank you. Incredible. He's still taking it in. Still taking it in. And I believe that this is the word that we've got right now. This is the word that we have to work with. And uh, this is the word that we want to move forward with. And it comes from 1 Samuel chapter 30 in the Bible where David had to... Uh, deal with coming back to his, uh, a place called Ziglag, where his family and his soldiers' families and all of the treasure that they had was taken. In other words, it was a moment of profound loss, so much so that the Bible says that his own men were so distressed, they were thinking of killing David and holding him responsible for the loss. But as they were weeping over their loss, there's a very powerful verse, and I'm focusing on this now in this broadcast for a reason, because we have to become a people that can handle the stress of backlash and reversals and the intensification of what it's like in the war zone when you're in the war room. And David, in his distress, strengthened himself. The Bible says he strengthened himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself. Somehow, he found a way to break out of the news cycle, out of the emotion of other people, out of the uh, calamity of the contradiction of here's this great ruler who is such a devoted servant of God who's lost everything. And what he says is, Lord, I'm seeking you. You've been with me. You've never failed me. He pulls himself into a place of being resourceful. And this is so important. At that moment, it, it, it occurs to him that he needs to get a hold of the priest because the priest has something called an ephod. It's kind of a mysterious thing, but it's, a, it's something that the, in the vestment of the high priest, they were able to consult it in order to get an oracle or an answer. You could say a prophetic insight into uh, the mind of the Lord. And so David inquires of the Lord, shall I pursue? Should I even attempt to go overtake this company? And the ephod, the high priest ephod somehow communicates, pursue, and you shall indeed overtake them and without fail recover everything. I believe that word that Paul just gave must be for us in that garden, in that place of prayer, in Washington. It must be for us the defining word that we're going to work with in the next season. That we believe it is God's will that there should be a rising up, a pursuing, and an overtaking. And I think consistent with that, we're watching the wheels come off of the deep state engine, which has worked on taking Michael Flynn to lock him up, Papadopoulos and destroying him, on Carter Page and destroying him. Innocent people who have been taken, uh, who have, whose lives have been ruined. And, uh, and there's also like, Roger Stone, that poor guy. You had CNN announced, uh, you know, CNN on his lawn and notified to come and SWAT teams to take this old man and his wife who is death. They basically are breaking in to, to arrest him like he's some kind of a drug lord. And I really believe that, you know, that, that the Flynn case um, 
the, uh, the stone case, the, the entire, all of these are going to be wrapped up together and are going to begin to unravel in a powerful way. And that's the moment we're in right now. And don't miss the fact that prayer is connected to that very phenomenon. Now, what is really interesting to me is that as the president is uh, putting his game together and he's strategizing on exactly what to do next, we're watching the coronavirus as, as, as states are trying to get back on their feet. We're watching blue state Democrat leaders who seem to be intent on actually destroying the economy. You have Nancy Pelosi, who, in, uh, who is right now come, cooking up billions and even trillions of dollars of greater debt that America can't possibly sustain. But when we get back here in a second, I want to show you the insight we have from an economist who is going to give us an idea as to what is really happening in the timeline of Pentecost, May 31st, and what you have to look for. So every day I devour a whole lot of information, and I'm looking at all the battle zones, right? So it's media, it's Hollywood, it's politics, it's geopolitical. And you know where I go? I go to something we call the 7M Underground. This is where the information, the journalists, the insider sources talk to me, and I'm able to do the videos and the one-on-ones that we can record and place over here so that you get a lot more depth of content than the one-minute snippets that I'm able to do on the program. So here we even have the prophetic corner because I'm very interested in the futurist perspective. I believe that God does show patterns and blueprints for things to come. And rather than going backwards and saying, oh, so-and-so said this or so-and-so said that and predicted it, I like to go forward. What is the uh, general consensus of what futurists are saying? We take that futurist perspective. We take the news that's happening right now we take the exclusive behind-the-scenes membership interviews, and we wrap it all up in what we call the underground. It's literally the resistance movement for people that are enlightened on the spiritual warfare that is breaking out in current events. And I welcome you to join me and meet me there. Thank you for joining us. Now, the big question we have to ask is what is going on globally? Because there's a bigger game happening here than just... Uh, what's going on within the deep state exposure and uh, the, the, the prayer meetings in the Rose Garden, as profound as they are. I would suggest to you that we are right now in a pivotal moment in history where China and the spiritual forces, if you will, that represent the influence of that nation have literally, through their laboratory in Wuhan, created this viral pathogen that has gotten out and affected the rest of the world. And what is particularly perplexing about this is that whether or not this happened as a result, as we are told, of an effort to try to create a vaccine in the event that this virus ever developed, or whether this was a, a weapons research project with the desire to find a vaccination, it never should have been done and is probable that China knew about it all the way back in November. The worst part of this is that the World Health Organization provided cover for China and lied about it and let the whole world get caught, in a sense, uh, flat-footed and unprepared for the, for the uh, pandemic. And maybe even worse than that is the fact that China cut off all flights from Wuhan to their capital. Beijing was protected but the flights went to New York and around the world. It tells us that China is not the country you think it is. And then in fact, the people are beautiful. There's 100 million Christians in China, but the party itself is in economic and ideologic warfare seeking global conquest. And here's the irony. The irony is that while in the United States and in Europe we look at borderless nations and a world without walls, et cetera, you have China intent on empire expansion in the, uh, in the Asian Pacific Rim. They're warning Australia and other countries, do not talk about China and this virus or there will be severe punishment economically for you. I want you to look at this for a moment. We have right now nations in the valley of decision. And, and the United States of America 
has its uh, 20 some, let's say $21 trillion economy. Powerful economy. Trump knows, President Trump knows that China has been at 11 trillion. They just gutted us from our position here. Now, what does that mean to the rest of the world? Well, it means that Germany and England and France, and uh, we could throw over here, uh, let's see, um, I'll put over here Taiwan, that these nations here are actually in the five or a four trillion dollar realm. People don't even get these numbers. They don't realize how this works. The, what is it, maybe six trillion, five trillion, four trillion, that's Germany, England, France, uh, Taiwan, and Israel is down there lower. And then down here, actually at the very bottom of this, you've got 190 nations that don't have as much as, you know, uh, half a trillion or $500 billion economies. Most of the nations here are, are following the rule of the influence of the United States as far as democracy is concerned. But uh, China, should China be able to succeed in going up to being the global power and the United States going down in, in a form of judgment economically, which has happened in history to other nations. Then something else comes into play. Because in this valley of decision, in this natural born economic valley of decision, the United Nations actually made a decision. And God said he was going to bring all nations into that valley of decision. The United Nations voted regarding the fate of Israel. And this comes as a shock. But there was 129 nations that voted against the right of Israel to exist with its homeland in Jerusalem as its capital. And only nine nations actually voted positively, stood with the United States, Guatemala being one of them, Toga, Micronesia, small countries, the combined strength of which would fill Kansas City, perhaps. The United States stood alone. But what is interesting to me is that it was the UK, it was France, it was the Pope's Italy. It was uh, Germany of all places. These nations themselves voted against Israel's capital. And why? Because of the power of uh, Middle Eastern influence in Europe and because along with China. I'll put China up there too. They are not the natural friends of the USA or Israel, they are the forced friends because as long as America is strong, the economies of the world are gonna be working with our value system. But the moment that we go down, and my friends, this is the moment in which Donald Trump was put into office. Donald Trump's the only one who's been warning about China from the beginning. He's the one that, uh, when he canceled flights from China, Immediately, the Democrats began calling him a xenophobe and a nationalist, and I want to remind you, Trump is a nationalist in the sense of believing that one ought to love and preserve their country, whereas the globalists are part of the global system. And Trump was warning that those globalists were gutting the American infrastructure and gutting jobs out of America, sending them to China for profit, and that the United States was actually not getting stronger but weaker because of the uh, rust belt unemployment, the opioid crisis which came in with China actually providing the drugs, and uh, the, the gutting of America. Trump came in and restoring the uh, ec economy, restoring jobs, restoring our status in the world, and putting a firewall up against China and challenging them. And now we're watching this frightening reset. I want you to listen to the wisdom of a friend of mine named Mark Nuttall, who is an economist, uh, who was a personal friend of Milton Friedman's, explaining why May 31st, why Pentecost is going to be a key time because of the virus effect on the economy and how we must have confidence, trust, and the supply chain held intact. The first thing that, that, that we must protect is the supply chain. It's not just, just businesses across the board. It's, it's how they are aligned with each other. So let me explain real quickly. The analogy that I use that seems to make sense uh, is, is say somebody's a farmer, a guy who's growing potatoes. Well, before he grows those potatoes, let's look at the chain. There's somebody selling the seed, the fertilizer, and the equipment. 
to produce uh, what he needed to do to plow his fields and plant his crop. When he harvests it, there is a there's probably a co-op, somebody he sells it to. From the co-op, there's a distributor that takes it to the different avenues, if you will. Is it going to be a finished or processed product or sold as Whole Foods as, a, as an organic potato? From there, it's processed. And from there, it's sold to those outlets. Could be a grocery store, could be French fries at McDonald's. And of course, the end of the line is the, is the consumer. The farmer has no relationship with anybody except one above him and one below him. The guy selling the seeds and the guy who sells his, that picks it up as, at his co-op. Now, why is this so important? Because there's no contractual relation all the way from the seed producer to the consumer. The, the, the trust in the system is that, that it works in the aggregate and you move in and out of that as a supply chain. What happens when it breaks? Each one of those entities are financed differently, have different banking concerns. There, there, there's a different capital requirement. There's a different labor requirement and they're self-contained entities in each one of those chains. And when one of them falls out, something has to replace it and it's not easy. Because then when it starts to come apart, you can't get the financing, you can't find the labor because no one will take the risk. And the way I explain it, this trust factor, Lance, is like this. It's like all of us know what fast food. And so you pull in the line at McDonald's and you order at the microphone and, and you're in the line and they start making the food right then. So the manufacturer trusts you that you actually wanted that cheeseburger. You go to the first window and they're in the head back there spending capital to do it. At the first window, you give them your money and they don't give you the cheeseburger. And you trust them at the next window to give you the cheeseburger that it all works. Because there's trust from the microphone to the window and everything in between that's going on. At any point that broke and, and, you, and you demanded uh, <clears throat> your food for your money at the point of the first window, they said, well, wait a minute. we got to have all your money up front before we even start cooking the hamburger. It's inefficient. It doesn't work as well. It can't be expandable. It's not scalable. And it cuts into services and the ability of the economy to produce. And so that trust, there's, there's the, the contract in between there. You could have walked away anywhere in that line, is my point. But when it breaks apart, and it's like having a, a tabletop that's moving on one pivotal point, and everything's rolling around. Different guys have different financing, different bank relationships, different risk capital, and they're trying to align them. There's nothing to hold it except the natural movement of the table up and down. And when you get that line back in place, then you've got a supply chain again. But when it breaks, like it did during the Depression, it takes maybe as much as 25 years to reestablish it, and only then with the intervening event. And so Mark Nuttall is sharing with us the importance of the supply chain. Once, like spans in a bridge, once those spans fall down, they fall down independently, they fall down separately, it doesn't just get built back up again. It takes decades because each of those portions is financed separately by banks and by infrastructure, and that is why we have to preserve the delicate supply chain and that's what's coming up. I am so distressed over what I see the Democrat governors and mayors uh, and politicians doing to play games, uh, not only with the struggling states that need to get back on their feet, but with the nation's budget as their, their lousy management of finances, they're asking Washington to bail them out with trillions and billions and trillions of dollars to cover over their incompetence managing their own budgets. And I'm praying that this is a moment when God is gonna make this president strong and like a uh, like and a resistance to this virus that is the virus that is uh, the spending disease that is part of America. But I believe that we're going to be seeing the zigzag moment, the prophecy fulfilled, and God at work. And that's why I'm optimistic, I'm focused, and I believe that we're going to have one of the most exciting summers of your life. I'll see you soon.